on this edition of the Self Publishing Show. He bookends with the hook at the top and he brings it back to that at the end. I like how he tries to build intrigue for the reader. Yeah, there's it, it was perfection. Publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers, no more barriers, no one standing between you and your readers. Do you want to make a living from your writing? Join indie bestseller Mark Dawson and first-time author James Blatch as they shine a light on the secrets of self-publishing success. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Yes, hello. Welcome to The Self-Publishing Show. My name is James Blatch. And my name is Mark Dawson. And this is another one of our much-anticipated, very valuable Book Laboratories, Book Lab. This is number four, Mark, I think. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, we've been doing them for, when did we start? Last, earlier this year? Year before? Can't remember. May, may have just gone over 12 months. I think three a year is probably what we'll be aiming for. Um, and they're quite involved because we have to have three experts who pour over basically the, the front page, the Amazon shop window of one particular book from one of our uh, Patreon supporters. And this uh, particular edition, we have chosen a book called Searching for Gatsby, which has been written by Nikki Danforth. Now, I should say, Mark, so far, we've had fairly positive feedback, haven't we, on all aspects of the books in the book lab? We have, yeah. They've been. Uh, I think the, the participants have got plenty of uh, good value out of being uh, dissected publicly by us. They have. Um, but I'm going to tease ahead and say that there's one element of this book that does not go down well with our expert. And so for the first time, we've got some fairly negative criticism coming back uh, on it. But uh, it's also quite a long episode. I'll, I'll tell you now, but it's very, very valuable. Jenny Nash, who's uh, doing the editorial um, uh, critique, has been excellent. And she has excelled herself once again, not only by uh, giving some very insightful advice uh, to Nikki, which we're going to listen to first, but she's also produced... Oh, your little Facebook like went up. Oh, over there, over <laughs> there. Yes, over there. that side. Yeah, yeah. I wonder what that was. I thought someone was. It was the ceiling was shaking, but no, it wasn't that. It's your so, very clever little real world thing. We should probably say just for those who are not watching on on YouTube uh, that behind me, over my shoulder, I have a, a Facebook like counter which um, syncs with my uh, whichever Facebook page I want. So that one's my book page. And when someone clicks like, um, it automatically um, updates it, and, and that's in real time. So they, they're mainly for uh, bricks and mortar stores. So if you had a florist, for example, and someone you had someone in the shop and they wanted to, to like you, they could see it tick over as soon as they tap their phone. But some someone somewhere in the world has just liked my author page. And we so, thank them for that. Well, we're, I, we're gonna, I certainly thank them, absolutely. Yeah, we're going to perhaps switch that over to uh, to self-publishing formula. We have, um, oh, I don't want to boast, but a few more likes than you have on your author page at the moment. We do, we do. So, um, okay, so there I was just explaining, before, uh, getting into Jenny Nash's uh, feedback, that once again, Jenny's also added some value for uh, listeners of the self-publishing show. She's produced two handouts, uh, The Hierarchy of Editorial Concerns, which is a really excellent PDF, and the one hour chapter audit. Um, now you can get all of these, you can get the original cover, you can get the before and after blurbs, you can you see all the way through uh, the blurb uh, submission from Brian, exactly how he and his team present you with a new blurb. So you get all the headlines for your Amazon ads, etc. You'll see all of that. Uh, and you get these two great handouts from Jenny. If you go to selfpublishingshow.com forward slash book lab four. So that's a new URL to match our new uh, show name, which is selfpublishingshow.com forward slash book lab for okay without further ado uh let's hear the editorial feedback this is jenny looking at the look inside those few pages whatever percentage it is of the front of your book that you get to show and display to potential readers on amazon so jenny reads that and gives her expert editorial feedback so let's hear from jenny and uh, then we'll uh, we'll move on to the next one this is the self-publishing show there's never been a better time to be a writer so before we start, okay. we talked about info dumps last time and you gave a fantastic handout and we've got lots of great feedback about it and people commented in the Facebook group that they've been writing for years and they learned stuff for the first time from you. So thank you so much for that. But the info dumps question, the info dumps question You're obviously welcome. has triggered quite a few people's, triggered actually the kids say that for being angry, don't they? But it's triggered a few thoughts and questions <laughs> uh, and one particular post caught my eye, which I thought it was worth just putting in front of you, if you don't mind, Jenny, putting you on the spot. But Jim Keen posted... Um, 
a section, in fact, the opening section of uh, a big sci-fi book this year, which he describes as being one of the it sci-fi books, Autonomous by Anna Lee Hewitt. Now, he said, this book's been really successful. All the sci-fi readers have read it. Isn't this an info dump, though? And, the, uh, and we'll include this in the handout so people can uh, make their own decision. But what did you think of this opening paragraph? So you did put me on the spot because this is a this is a thing that um, I hear a lot, and and this is a great example actually. And I think it was a really astute question, and I particularly love the writer. I just want to call this out because it's so great. The writer says, "I'm trying to learn how to get this right." I mean, I love how intentional he is about it and looking towards somebody doing it well to try to learn. And something I do actually advise against is is doing this because I love his intention and I love his seriousness, but t- looking to somebody who's a big, hot, you know, success and written a, a big it book is not always the best way to learn because we're often looking at genius or we're looking at somebody who's just happened to hit the trifecta of luck and timing and talent and it's all come together in this perfect storm and and then here we are trying to write our story and just trying to get the fundamentals right and sometimes looking at that is not the best way to learn it can be it can be um frustrating because there's not always something to learn I, I think what you guys are doing on Book Lab is a better way to learn, which is let's look at people who have some room to improve and some room to grow and figure out how they could do better. That being said, um, this is a really interesting example and we can try to see what we can learn from this. So I would agree that I have not read this book. In fact, I have not even heard about this book, which I find now somewhat embarrassing because I like to be think that I am on top of everything in publishing, but who could be on top of all the things? Um, So this is apparently a book that's doing really well. And it does sort of feel like an info dump. It is an unusual way to start a novel because there's so much information here and it is a little unnecessary at this moment, which is a moment when we know nothing else. So I would probably be advising a writer I was working with to let this slow down a little or start it in a slightly different moment. I, I might in fact give that advice to somebody. So I think that the the question writer is correct in saying, isn't this kind of info dumpy? So why is it working? I think it is the right question to ask. And because it is kind of info dumpy. And but what's good about it, the reason that I think it does work, and this is so critically important. So um, this woman is in this place that is clearly very unusual. It's a sci-fi book, so we know something's going on here. And what what the author is doing very well is letting us inside of this woman's head. So at, in the first couple sentences, that's not true. She's just in a field. She's been working in this place. There's something sort of strange going on because she's got these special lenses. And then there's this very unusual... Um, line that the yellow flowers are emitting streams of environmental data. So we know we're in a very unusual world. But here's the place where this becomes not an info dump. The author says, probably Jack reflected the same farmer's tan had afflicted every chin for generations. It went back to the days when her great great grandparents came across the Pacific from Shenzhen and brought or bought an agricultural franchise in the prairies outside Saskatoon. No matter how far she was from home, some things did not change. My guess is that that is an encapsulation of the entire point of the story. We've got an immigrant. We've got a a woman who came from a generations of farming. We've got, but clearly we're in a really different world of farming where we're farming environmental data. So what the, the author has done is dropped us in a world, dropped us in this field, given us infor- this, these bits of information, but in that second half of it, given us the internal reason this matters to Jack. This matters to Jack because this has everything to do with who she is, who her family is, what the world is, who she's trying to be in it. So the, it's not that, that makes it not an info dump. That makes it really good storytelling because there is deep meaning here. There's deep underlying tension here. There's, we, we really want to know what's going on. And we want to know, 
uh, what's going on, not just with the physical reality, like what is this field of flowers that emit data and what are these, these goggles that are deactivated lenses and what is this person doing there? But oh, what does this have to do with who she is and who her people are and, and what she's going to be? So that line, no matter how far she was from home, some things did not change. Don't you guess that this is going to be a story about how maybe she's going to try to change it? So yeah. this is actually just superb writing and, and it is a little info dumpy, but a re really excellent writer is able to pull off things that the rest of us are not able to pull off. And Which if, sort of reiterates your point that you, t you can't necessarily read James Patterson or Stephen King and think, I'm going to do what they do because they're operating sometimes in a different realm to us mortals. Yeah, the danger would be if if somebody just took the first three sentences here and, and wrote a whole paragraph like that, you, you would never get anybody's attention. I'm often um, in the position of helping people trying to land agents. That's the point at which I, I often come in and help somebody. And if if your first paragraph is just the sun is glaring and there's circles under her eyes and it's a farmer's tan and there's flowers and they're emitting this thing and it's just it's like blah 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 and your whole opening paragraph is that probably the agent's just going to whip by it for the other 300 submissions in in her inbox yeah so this is this is a very delicate balancing act that this writer has done done well and we should say this is, I've just had a look at uh, the publishers. So this is um, from Little Brown, who are an imprint of Hatchet. And I've met some of these guys and they have a, a fantastic editorial staff there. So this this would have been, every word of that would have been gone over several times. So it's, it's not an accident. It's not one that snuck through. As you say, she's doing something and getting away with it doesn't necessarily mean that um, you and I can follow that or I can follow that, I should say. Well, and it, you know, what's interesting is, is levels of getting away with things. So, so here's what it's, it's three sentences. I would, I would argue actually that it's two sentences. The first two sentences are a little bit flat and straight information, but all of a sudden in the third sentence, we've got flowers emitting streams of environmental data. And it's like, wait, what? And then yeah. boom, that fourth sentence, we're right inside the character's head. So you, your writers will, I mean, sorry, your readers will give you a little leeway. They'll, they'll read a couple sentences. They'll read, you know, okay, like, let me see what this is. What's going on here? But if you're not bringing it right after that, if you're not engaging them and telling them why it matters and getting inside the head and letting us see this character struggling with whatever she's struggling with, you're not going to, you're not going to grab them. So the, the writer of your question here was extremely astute because it is technically at the start an info dump but it's also so well done right after that and so interesting and can you see the world building that went on here this is a whole world that has logic that has there's there's things about the sun there's things about flowers there's things about travel there's things about legacy there's like this is a whole world an agricultural franchise in the prairies, like what? You know, so there's, you can see there's a whole world happening there. And the, the writer was not making this up when they wrote the paragraph. They know this world inside and out, and they chose to drop the reader into that moment. So it's very powerful, but, but also a very astute question from your listener. In the hands of a really good writer, a lot of information can come across in a really excellent way and not as it just being dumped on it. So an info dump is not necessarily just where there's a bunch of information that's bad. An info dump is where it feels like the writer is dumping this information and it's not organic to the story or part of the story. If it's filtered through a character and filtered through the story and it's got a reason for being there, you can give all the information you want. So normally if, if you're seeing a very accomplished writer doing that, you should look for the other things they're doing as well in addition to that, that info dump thing. And then the other thing that I have to say about this is I hear this 
all the time and you can see I'm smiling. It makes me smile so much because people will say, well, like anything that I teach, people say, well, uh, James Patterson doesn't do that or John Irving doesn't do that or, you know, uh, Elizabeth Gilbert doesn't do that. Like all the famous super best selling mega stars. And you can't learn to write by looking at what the mega stars are doing. First of all, they've probably earned the right in their career to do whatever they want. Yeah. <laughs> Second of all, they probably have some innate storytelling genius that the rest of us just don't have. And if you had it, you would know already that you had this innate genius. So I think pointing to exceptions in very well published writers is not useful to somebody trying to make their way and trying to learn. It's, it's, actually more effective to look at things that aren't working well, I think, or things that you don't enjoy. Uh, prior to the uh, airing here, um, you and I were talking about a book that, that you read where it just was like, eh, this is not working for me. That's the learning point because then you can say, okay, well, why not? Why isn't this working yeah. for me? And usually you can identify why or why not. And that to me is more effective than looking at, you know, Stephen King and saying, well, he does that. So uh, that's what I'll do. <laughs> yeah. It's like watching Serena Williams and then going out to the tennis court and wondering why you can't do what she did yesterday. Well, exactly. Like and, and I've been, um, I've been a little bit obsessed with the, um, Masterclass, which is a new, a new business, mm -hmm. or maybe it's not so new. You mentioned Serena Williams. They have, Serena Williams teaching you to play tennis or Steph Curry teaching you to shoot a free throw or, you know, um, um, I'm blanking on the comedian. A Annie Leibovitz, I think, yeah, does yeah, the yeah, photography yeah. and James Patterson does the writing. Yes, exactly. And, but actually, and I love them. They're amazing. But actually, you're not learning how to do the thing they're, do they're doing. What you're learning is how do they do the thing they're doing. Yeah, yeah. And that's definitely is, the case with James Patterson's one. Yeah, what is their particular genius? And there's, it's, it's fascinating to see what is their particular genius. But you can't really replicate that because they're a genius. <laughs> yeah, it's a pro. It's a profile, deep profile of them. They are good, and um, yeah, I enjoyed that. Okay, well, what I thought I'd get out of the way because it was a talking point, which is great, and I think we're going to get another one. So we have Nikki Danforth's uh, book, which is called "Searching for Gatsby," and uh, you have the job of reading the uh, the sort of five percent or so that you get as a look inside, and telling us where it's working, where it's not working, et cetera. What, what are your thoughts, Jenny? So this is a great uh, lesson for us because this is the third book in a series and it's a, a private eye series, a lady detective sort of amateur sleuth. Um, the protagonist of the story is a 50 something divorcee who solves crimes, which is just a great setup. And this is book three in that series. And what I immediately saw in reading the sample material is something that probably a lot of people skip over and I'm gonna point it out because in the beginning when there's that front matter where it says this is a work of fiction, names, character, places, and incidents have been changed. And just before that, you'll see that this writer has received the copyright to use the lyric from a Bruce Sting, uh, Springsteen song, Dancing in the Dark. And I point that out because I, I look at everything when I look at a book and when I looked at that front matter and I saw that I thought, oh, this is a serious writer because most writers don't know that they should get permission for lyrics. They don't know that they're part of a sort of whole publishing ecosystem. They don't follow the, the rules necessarily if they're bringing their own books out. And this writer has done that. And so in my mind, I that immediately marked her as a pro. And um, everybody should pay attention to, to that sort of thing, the copyright, the permissions, and particularly around song lyrics. People can't believe that you're not allowed to quote a Beatles song or, or Bruce Springsteen, but you're not. And there right. are rules around these things. And she obviously did what she had to do to get permission. So I just wanted to give a shout out to her for that because that's fantastic. Very good. Absolutely. So that was the, the first thing that I, and that I saw. The next thing that I saw is the opening pages, the introduction of this book 
also marks Nikki as a real pro because this is a really fun opening. It's got a lot of momentum. We follow a guy, we don't know who he is, but he's out in the woods. He's got this dog with him. He's he's up to no good. We can tell he's up to no good. He's, he's doing something secret and sneaky. He's trying to maintain cover. He's in the woods and immediately the, the writer is engaged. We want to know what's going on. Who is this guy? What's he doing? And, and since we're following him, there's a sense that like, is he really the bad guy? Like what's going on mm. here? So there's, there's multiple layers of curiosity that, that have been raised in this opening. And, and the writing is really fun. It's snappy. It moves along. We, we get inside this guy's head. Um, the paragraph that starts uh, it's about uh, three down in the intro. Clicking open the trunk, the wiry man steps out of the old Honda Accord. A car speeds by and he almost ducks down. Get with it, old man, he chides himself. It's just folks heading home. I just love that little bit of writing because, you know, we can see this guy. He's he's wiry, he's old, he's, he's talking to himself in the soothing sort of, he's got this sort of wisdom and we like him. And, but we also know these trees probably about to commit a crime. So it's just, this opening is, is interesting. It's fun. It's got multiple layers. It's really well written. It's snappy. It's great. And it has what I refer to as narrative drive. So narrative drive is that thing you want in everything you write, where it's the engine that's, that's pulling you through and it's driving you through and it's one thing and you want to know, the reader wants to know, well, what, what does that mean? What's going to happen next? What's going on here? And that's especially in this type of a book in anything that's a mystery, a detective, a thriller, anything, you want that drive to be really strong. Really, it's in, in any genre. So a lot of this opening is just very, very well done. I, I also like, as we get a little bit further down, um, so this guy changes his clothes and, and sneaks into a, a mansion. And he's, so now we know he's, he's doing up to no good in this house. And it's very interesting because he comes across a rare book room and then he comes across a, a first edition of The Great Gatsby and he immediately knows what the book is. He recognizes particular typos that are apparently well known in that edition. So all of a sudden now we've got this guy who's you know, a criminal, he's sneaking around the woods. He's an old guy. He, he's got this, this great sort of um, wisdom and voice that he speaks to himself in. And now he's a rare book expert. Like you're thinking, mm -hmm. okay, here's a whole other level. What's happening here? So, um, and I love the reference back to the title because it's all, you know, the, the reader What's so fun for a reader in a book like this is staying a little bit ahead, right? You're thinking, ah, I think I know what this is going to be or what's, what role is this book going to play? So it's just, it's just a lot of fun, um, that, that whole opening bit. And so that you're probably thinking, okay, is she just doing everything well? Is that it? Are we done, <laughs> are we done here? <laughs> and there is a big butt coming. So, okay. um, when I got to the end of the intro, the it felt very flat for me. And when I talked about narrative drive, the one of the best ways to lock in narrative drive is at the end of scenes, the end of chapters, when you're driving to the next thing. And at the end of the intro, this writer leaves us off with these words. The thief returns the book to its shelf in the glass cabinet and goes back to searching the room. So in the reader's head, you probably are thinking this to yourself. You're thinking, okay, and so, like what, okay? Like it's, it's a sort of flat. Whereas she could have done something there to, to, to set up a decision or a, um, a moment or a um, crossroads or some sort of risk that that thief takes, something they see that's that's going to propel us to the next thing. And instead, she, she doesn't take that opportunity. And I noticed this at the end of chapter one and chapter two as well. So what we're talking about here now, and this is my favorite thing to talk about, is you've got something that's really good. How are you going to get it to great? 
That's what every, what every writer wants is to go from good to great. This is really good. The opening is really good. We just went through all the things that Nikki does really well. How is she going to now take it to great? And to take it to great, you have to start looking at some higher level concerns. And so I actually want to bring up a graphic that we're going to share um, with the listeners that I call the hierarchy of editorial concerns. This okay, so I should say for the YouTube version, people will see this on screen. Uh, if you don't watch the YouTube version, just listen to it, you can download everything, including uh, the full version of the hierarchy of editorial <laughs> concerns that um, Jenny's very kindly presented for you. Uh, if you go to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash book lab four. And uh, yeah, but YouTube's the place to be for this particular episode, Jenny, because it's gonna be visual. So here we go. Yeah, so the hierarchy of editorial concerns is based on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So that's the famous um, hierarchy of self-actualization for human beings. And I, I base this, uh, this on, on that famous uh, pyramid and hierarchy. And what you can see is that at the base level of the pyramid are the fundamental elements every story has to have. You know, the story has to have a point and a purpose. The world of the story has to be believable and logical. There's got to be this narrative drive, this cause and effect trajectory that's propelling us forward. And the protagonists have to have some clear desire and something standing in their way. If your story doesn't have these fundamental elements, you can't really move on. You've, you've got to get those locked down before you can move up the pyramid. The, and as we go further up the pyramid, the, the second stage is the point of view needs to make sense to the story and it has to serve it. And the point of view characters have to have emotions that we can see and feel and be part of. That means the writer needs to be showing and not telling. And the protagonist needs to make decisions with clear consequences. So from what we've been talking about, what Nikki's been doing, she hits a lot of these points really strongly. She's got those really locked in. And even I would say the third level up, she's got locked in pretty well. But now we're starting to get to the point, how do you go from good to great is at the top levels of the pyramid. So we can take that graphic down and come back to Nikki's work now. And what I wanna talk about is some things that I found that are correlated to that hierarchy that she could be doing better to take it to, from good to great. Okay. So I've got three. Okay. Well, you've got three. <laughs> this is uh, this is great. This is a very well thought. Well, as I'd expect from you, Jenny, well thought okay. and structured. <laughs> so the three things that I think Nikki could be doing better is she often sips into a passive voice, and this really, in my mind, stops her narrative. And I'm going to point out just one place where where she does this. It's back up in the introduction. And um, I'm sorry, I'm just paging through to try to find it to, to point you to, to where, um, where this is. It's so hard on the uh, Amazon site because you can't bookmark anything, but I've got it. Right. It's right after the first um, line break in the introduction. There's, there's a little, um, some little dashes that form a line break there. And the line there is, the mysterious stranger who moments ago looked like any other property owner in the area has transformed completely dressed now in black from head to toe. So this is a very passive sen sentence. And the way you can tell is that telltale has transformed. So she's talking very passively and objectively about this, about this stranger. This is our old guy in the woods. He has transformed completely that, that the reader is not invited into that. We don't get to see him transform. We don't get to see him change his clothes. We don't get to see him dress in black from head to toe. We, we're just told that he did it. And we're told in this very passive way. He, he has transformed completely. And it's little things like that, that when you look at the really excellent writers, they're cleaning up all these little instances that, that actually push the reader out. What you want to do is always let the reader be in. You want us to be inside the action, inside the protagonist's head, inside the scene as it unfolds. And the minute you start to passively tell us what, what happened, this is telling us what already happened. He, he already changed his clothes. 
from head to toe. And the fix on this is very small. It would probably be taking that one sentence and making it two sentences or three and letting us see the guy, you know, take off whatever he was wearing before, his denim shirt or his plaid jacket and, and put on a black turtleneck and let us actually see him do it. And is, is that not him in the previous section though? Slipping off his jacket, the guy hangs it on another branch. Is that him? Yeah, so she set that up. That's exactly right. So he comes to this tree and he ties his dog up and he uses the tree as a kind of a dressing area. He's clearly done this before because he knows the tree. He's he's the dog is going to wait for him. He's got it all set up. But but there's just this this. Um, I see what you're saying. So it's the, it's the transformation. It's more than just the clothes. There's a transformation of this person. He slipped into his alter ego, his other character, but we exactly. don't really feel that or experience that. We just told it. Exactly. And I would, with, if I were coaching this writer, I would say the biggest thing that just happened happened off stage, and it's a tiny little thing, but we didn't get to see it go down. We saw him begin that transformation. We saw, we got the sense he's done this before. It seems like a very big deal. I, I don't know because I haven't read the whole book, but I suspect that this guy is not at all what we think he is. I don't think he's just a part-time cat burglar. You know, he's probably uh, something to do with a famous antiquated, uh, you know, very uh, pricey book dealers or something. And and so seeing him take, like, I want to know what exactly the clothes he takes off were and what how, what is this transformation? You know, he pulls on this black ski mask and a black vest, but like, yeah, let us see that he's all new. He's a totally new persona and, and we're in it and we get to, to be there with him. And, and these, that, these, sorry, Jane, I was going to say these, these moments when somebody does something are opportunities for you to get inside somebody's head when you're a writer. So when they, when they have to drive somewhere, that's a great time for them to be not concentrating on the road because they're distracted by what it, and it's, it gives you an opportunity. I'm finding this now. It gives the, the opportunity you need to tell what they're thinking and where they're going. Yeah, uh, and I this. and I will share with your listeners if you'll help me remember um, a post that I wrote that is a mistake a lot of writers make is is letting physical detail stand in for the true story. So in this case, the um, the writer has the guy come up. He takes off his fedora. Like I love that. We know he was wearing a fedora. He um, puts on these sneakers. He um, he he takes off some moccasins. Like we see him doing that. It's very physical and, and we see him going through that and now he is transformed, but it's that physical detail is it, sort of left on its own. And what we want to know is what is the meaning of that physical detail? And, and people often do this. Um, I see this all the time in people say, their skin was sweaty, their heart was pounding, their you know, throat closed up, they felt flushed, um, their gut hurt, like all the physical realities. But the truth is that emotion, the physical realities are the end result of emotion. We feel those physical things after we have felt some sort of emotion and some sort of transformation actually. And, and a lot of writers miss the real story because they're so focused on the physical. This, this writer actually is doing it very, very well. And um, I, I, when I'm talking about taking something to good, from good to great, it's just the tiniest sliver of a change where, okay, let us now see him inhabit that transformation. Um, there's a really great quote that the actress Meryl Streep once said, Somebody asked her, how do you play a queen? If you're a queen, how do you play that authority? How do you play that regalness? Um, how do you do that? And her answer was, you don't have to do anything. It's all about how the other people in the room treat you. It's all mm. about how they see you, how they perceive you. Well, do they stand up when you walk in the room? Do they rush to you when you walk in the room? And it's inhabiting that reality that a queen probably never gets to walk in a room and not have that happen. 
And, yeah. and so knowing that and letting us feel that and see that, that's the kind of thing we're talking about here. So the um, I was pointing out the has transformed because we've been taken through the the clothing but then that just the choice of that language there now the guy has transformed completely he's dressed in black change that sentence just a little bit let us let us see what that feels like let us see how he inhabits that skin if you will let us see what that means to him you know does he feel confident and 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 stealthy and awesome and uh, you know he's probably done this a million times let us feel that let us feel the transformation. And so it's a, um, it's a kind of passive, passive language to stand in for something that's actually really important. And it's transformation. Yeah. And this tiny little tweak of, of the language. And when I, when I was going through this, I literally highlighted the words has transformed completely. Those are the offending words and, and it's not, there's three words. It's not very many, yeah. but fix yeah. those up. And I think this story goes to a whole different level. So that was, that was thing one that I saw that Nikki could do to take her work from good to great. Thing two was I mentioned before the opening falling flat at the end of the introduction. And if your listeners will go through and look at the end of that intro and then scroll down and look at the end of chapter one. Um, this, she does the same thing at the end of chapter one. So chapter one is, is fascinating. There's a total shift. We leave the guy in the woods behind and now we're with the protagonist, Ronnie, who is the detective. And she's at a big party, fancy party at a mansion. And the reader obviously knows it's the same mansion that the guy is breaking into. So there's a lot of tension in that. There's a party going on. And we're with, we're with uh, Ronnie there in chapter one. And we really start the story that's gonna bring Ronnie together as this amateur sleuth with the crime that's, that's going down. So that's what's happening in chapter one. It's a, it's a shift into the protagonist and into this party and what's going on. But at the end of chapter one, um, again, she lets the scene really sort of just stop. So um, it says, more importantly, without this woman right in her face, the evening is now nicer for Marilyn. She's quietly singing to herself and her mood appears to have lifted. It, it's, there's nothing driving us forward there. It's, it's just end of scene. And it's fascinating because in chapter two, um, now we know a little bit more about Ronnie. There's a, she's divorced. There's a love interest. We get to meet him. There's a lot of fantastic banter. And at the end of chapter two, an explosive sound outside makes us jump. So now the party's dis disrupted by something. That's a fantastic that, ending. That's a good last line, isn't it? Right? So imagine if there was that type of a last line at the end of the intro and the end of the first chapter, we would have that much more compelling reason to like, well, you can't read a sentence like an explosive sound outside makes us jump without going, well, what was it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and you really want to think about your reader. This is a sad reality, but your reader is tired. Your reader is busy. Your reader is overwhelmed. Your reader can watch Netflix if they want to. They can pick up any other book if they want to. You need to really keep them engaged in your story and give them a reason to care about the characters and about the situation. And when you come to the endings of things, and I teach this in every scene, sorry, I just bashed the microphone. In every scene, in every chapter, you want to end with something changing. And it doesn't have to be an explosive sound outside the party. It can just be a decision, a new way of looking at something, uh, maybe a realization that you think that person just lied to you, maybe a resolution that you're going to do something different. Um, something that is the, the person taking some sort of action or having some sort of agency over what they're doing. We want to see that. And, and cleaning up those ends of chapters is a fantastic way to just take the narrative drive and amp it up a notch, especially in this type of a, of a book. 
I'm, I'm smiling because it explains why Lizette, who works for you and <laughs> works for me now, for about the first half a dozen scenes, the last line she always said, but what is Rob going to do? What's yes. he going to do? So I, I think I did the same thing as Nikki did here. And I think writers may do this because you know what's going to happen. And you you think you're setting the scene, so everything seems fine, but it's not going to be. But of course, unless you unless you give a hint to the reader that it's not going to be okay, that things are going to change dramatically, they don't know that. So it's not enough just to say she relaxed and was enjoying the evening at the end of a scene. No. I can completely. I'm starting to get that. And the thing that makes me more crazy than anything else is if I point that out to someone and I sit like, let's say Nikki was here with us, and I said, "Do you see how it falls flat at the end of?" of the intro in chapter one, but how you nail it here in chapter two, go, let go back and make something good happen there at the end of those first two. Oftentimes what the writer will do is they'll say, uh, but I don't want to give anything away. I don't want to give away what's going to happen. And, and in fact, in this case, you don't want to give away about the burglary or the book or whatever, but you do want to give away, what are these people thinking? What are they, what's going on in their head? Why are we paying any attention to them today? And I often say that, like, why today are we paying attention to this woman and why not yesterday? And, and why are we looking at her in this moment, in this scene, at this party, instead of when she was getting ready for the party? You know, what about, why are you presenting this moment? And it's always, the answer is always, always, always going to be something is being revealed about your character. Story is about change. That's all it is. It's about how do people change? And people change in a million different ways, right? So change can be good or bad. Change can be falling in love, falling out of love. Change can be an explosive sound outside and there's a burglar in the house. What are we gonna do? Somebody's gonna rise to the occasion. Um, change can be, I look across the room at somebody that I've known all my life and I think, I actually don't really like you. That can be change. Change can be, I am tired of um, my dumb job doing whatever. I'm going to get a different job. So change can be a decision, a resolution, a crossroads. It doesn't have to be big drama. But if a story is about change, a scene in a chapter is measuring a small arc of that change. And we've got to make sure that you're showing the reader that. And I started by saying the craziest thing is when people say, but mm. it gets really good mm. in chapter 17. Like really cool stuff happens <laughs> in chapter 47. And you know, you, your reader's gone by then. So you've got to give them a sense of that arc of change at every single turn. So, so Nikki could amp up this, her game here by gi giving us some better yeah. chapter. And is this why you talk talk to me at the beginning and talk to other, your authors about why they are telling this particular story. In other words, what is this about? Because that would help you with those moments. If you, you know, there's no point in it being passive at the end of a chapter. If you know that the theme of this book is, you know, how divorce has changed somebody or, you know, just there's something destructive. Every sentence can be a, Oh, see, I'm like so proud of you right now. What you just said, because you said, oh my gosh, I love that. Okay, here's a thing that your readers can do. Go to Nikki's page, and this is what I did after I read her sample pages. Read what people are saying about this story. Read what the, she's got some pretty yeah, good she ratings. Has. Um, she's got 111 four and a half star ratings. Read those 100 and, and really read them all and see what are people saying about this book? Why do they care? Why are they reading it? Why are they paying any attention? And it's exactly what you were talking about because how refreshing to see a PI who's a woman, who's a divorced woman, who's trying to make her way, who's trying to find herself, who's got these skills and she's bringing them to bear to help people solve crimes. And there's that's a lot of what people are responding to. And so knowing there's gotta be something in Nikki that she connects to that. I don't obviously know a thing about her, but maybe she's a child of a divorced family. Maybe she's divorced herself. Maybe her best friend got divorced. You don't choose a divorced PI just for the heck of it. You, you, do, you probably do it because you have some deep connection to that and, and you take it and you make something a fictional thing from it. And knowing what why you're doing that and what your story is about, and the reason I'm so proud of you for saying that, James, is that um, 
Every story is about something. Every story makes a point. This is supposed to be a fun page turning PI. It's very much like Clue down in chapter um, three, the, the game Clue. It's very Clue like because um, Ronnie actually herds all the guests into the library where they're going to, you know, stay until they figure out who done it. So it's it's fun. It's kind of a romp, right? It's kind of a um, sometimes they're referred to as cozy mysteries. Mm -hmm. It's not like a grizzled, you know, hard bitten noir kind of thing. It's meant to be fun. And so some people will say, well, why does that have to have a point? It's just a fun. It's just a fun story. But it does have a point. Every book has a point. And readers want to feel that and know that. And not that you have to hit them over the head with it. But but I think Nikki actually does a really good job of weaving this in. There's there's some um, a real sense that this is this character is not just a cardboard cutout of a detective. She's, you know, a real person with a real life coming to this work for some particular reasons. And, and we want to know that. You can tell that from those comments, uh, as you say in the reviews, of how many said that they felt a connection with Ronnie. Uh, and that can't be because Nikki's just randomly created somebody. She's telling a story about who somebody is and the effect things have had on them and why it's shaped them. And, and that's, that's the stuff, right? That's why we read books because that's exactly when it. we can make that connection. That's exactly it. And I would urge people to read instead of going like you were talking about the famous writer who does this thing, you know, and why can't I do the thing they did? And, Instead of looking at famous writing in that way, what I would urge people to do is go read what people say about the work. We have this amazing resource at our fingertips, which is Amazon and Goodreads, and you can do that. You can go to, um, you know, the latest blockbuster and and go read what people say. And if you spend an hour reading what people say about a Stephen King book. You're going to just get so much information about what the readers are taking from it and why they care and what this means to them. And it's a really great kind of a study. And and this is a the, the example this week is a really great one to do this with because there's only 111 um, comments. It's not overwhelming. You can really get a sense of, of what um, of what people are feeling and and again, she's got those story fundamentals really locked down. What I would like to see her do now is get these next level things um, and, and the transitions at the end of the chapters is it. So look at the intro, look at the end of chapter one and look at the end of chapter two and see how at the end of chapter two, she does a much better job of hooking the reader and yanking us in to the next chapter and and in the intro and in chapter one it falls a little flat so to take it to, to the next level she could bring that decisiveness to the end of her other absolutely chapter. you have a third of course you have a I third, have a third. Have a two I'm this a is third. an entire podcast in its own right um i have a th I have a third skill that Nikki could do to to be um, to take this to the next level, and it, it relates to info dumps, which we talked about in the last book lab. So we could link up that last book lab so people could learn about info dumps. But she actually has a couple places where she does what I would call mini info dumps, and I'm going to point one out to you because they this is. Now, somebody who's trying to really get structure down is not going to need to focus on this. But somebody who's doing the fundamentals very well would want to focus on this because this is how you get the next level writing. At the very beginning of chapter one, um, in the uh, second paragraph, you hear Ronnie say, then there's my late model bright red Mustang convertible, which pales in comparison with its top down, of course, even though it's late September. So this is a fun detail that she drives this fun car and she drives it with the top down. This is great. But nobody in the history of humankind has ever actually said either to another person or in their own head, then there's my late model bright red Mustang convertible. Like we just don't think that way or talk that way. And it it's actually a little mini info dump. It's a little mini awkward moment where the writer's trying to convey something to us, but it's not baked into the story. 
And I want to show you a little bit further down where she does this really well so you can see the difference because it makes such a big difference. So if you look in chapter one, just down from the top, there is the lyric of that Bruce Springsteen song we spoke about. And just after that, there is a line where, where Nikki does this thing again. It's a little awkward moment info dump where she says, I run my fingers through my shoulder length straw colored hair. So again, <laughs> I say that to what, myself what all the time. To do is I'm just running my <laughs> <laughs> Right? Nobody ever. <laughs> but the author's trying to give us a picture of this person. And it's, it's just sort of clunky. I run my fingers through my shoulder length straw colored hair. But a little bit later down, about four paragraphs down, she does that Meryl Streep thing that I was talking about instead, where instead of having the character um, speak about her own looks and her own self, she has a friend say something. So now she's talking further down. Um, she's talking to her friend Marilyn. And Marilyn says, um, don't you realize, darling, that you're a hot ticket ever since you came back on the market? Hot ticket, my eye. Come on, I'm closing in on 56, and that's hardly a hot ticket. Marilyn drops into her lower vocal register, all in the eye of the beholder. Her throaty laugh is irresistible, and I join in. Seriously, Ronnie, look at you, my hostess says, lean and blonde and stylish and hip and amusing. So this is great because this is an organic way for somebody else to let us know how Ronnie looks instead of Ronnie herself saying, I run my hand through my straw colored hair. It's perfect, this, this place down here where Marilyn does it instead. So again, it's a tiny moment, it's a little awkward thing, but if you clean those things up, then this is just gonna trip along and it's gonna have so much more um, meat and, and um, authenticity, and it will really take it to the next level. So to, to finish up my little <laughs> mini lesson on taking your work from good to great, I also have to share with everyone a document I call the one hour chapter audit. And it lets you check off the things that you're doing and not doing well. And you can just take your chapter, spend an hour, tick off the things, and it goes with that hierarchy of editorial concerns. And so you can realize, oh gosh, I've got some fundamental things I really need to fix. Or you'll be able to look at your checklist and say, oh, I just need to clean up some of these little things and, and I'll be good. So for, for Nikki, that's what I would suggest is she's got it. She's got the fundamentals, but now let's let's really lock in the stuff that's going to make it um, really that's sing. fantastic, Jenny. We could, uh, we could listen to you all night on this subject. And... Um, <laughs> I know if you hadn't stopped yeah, that, me, that you would, might that would have be fine to. by us. Uh, really great. And uh, I'm so pleased for Nikki <laughs> that she got such uh, constructive feedback from you as well. I know that she was excited about um, having her book selected for this. And I can't imagine for one second that when I speak to her, which will also be in this episode, that she won't be thrilled with the type of feedback she's had. And she should be proud right, of what she's writing and creating here because this is gripping, compelling, it's funny, it's quirky. And you can just tell from those 111 odd, nearly all four and five star reviews that her readers are lapping it up as well. Absolutely. And, and the things that I'm talking about here are, well, what I would say is they're frosting on the cake. She's got the cake. So if somebody's trying to, to get their skills and their story fundamentals in place, they don't need to worry about these things yet. And in fact, I think that would be a disservice to somebody to worry about line by line little problems like this. They're, these are nitpicky little problems, but for somebody already doing everything well, this is how you go to the next level. And I think, I think Nikki could get there. This is the self-publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. So a long uh, interview with Jenny, but really worth every minute of it. And, um, I, you know, pleasing, obviously, for Nikki to hear that uh, Jenny absolutely loved the whole 50-something divorcee hero of the book because, um, well, frankly, there's probably not enough people uh, creating characters who are in that position, but it reflects a lot of people's lives. So she loved that aspect of it. I very rudely asked Nikki whether she was 50 and divorced in her interview, just in case that, you know, it was or, or semi-autobiographic, but she's happily married. So she's invented um, invented the, uh, oh, I've forgotten the name of the character. It is Ronnie Lake, of course. Take the power of the imagination. 
Yes, so that's amazing, isn't it? What the imagination Incredible. can do. Um, and I will remind you, as, as Jenny said, that she's uh, included her two handouts, the hierarchy of editorial concerns and the one hour chapter audit. Um, I, let me ask you, Mark, are you still learning how to write? Yeah, of course, all the time. Um, the more the more you read, the more experience you get, you can always improve. Um uh, I've got a pretty good, I know, you know I'm very confident in my voice now. I've got a lot of books um, behind me, but you can always improve. Um, it's not It's not so much now that I'm kind of worried about moving punctuation around. I think I'm more you know, confident enough that, that that's something that just comes naturally, but you can always improve your word choice, uh, pacing, dialogue, um, structure, um, all kinds of things can always be tweaked and improved. So even after all those all those books that I've written and the copies that I've sold, I'm still never satisfied with how good I can I can become. Yeah, that sounds like the right attitude to have. Okay, now I told you that one of the experts uh, did not give favourable feedback on what he or she saw. Well, it's not Jenny. We've heard Jenny. She really liked Nikki's writing, but gave a lot of uh, good advice as well. Um, and let's find out whether it is the blurb. So let's hear from Brian Cohen. This is the self-publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Last time we spoke, uh, you were in my bedroom in Vegas. It's true. It was a lot of fun. I I never expected how fun it would be to be in your bedroom. Uh, yeah, that's right. And we both sat down thinking we were doing different things, which was <laughs> how, how it always happens in a Vegas bedroom. Uh, but we, we managed to... Um, we got a bonus episode out of you, actually, which was a really good one about mindfulness and overwhelmed. Oh, thanks. So, and uh, as a bonus to people watching on YouTube, you've got beautiful earrings that, that come I out. I do. They look amazing. Yeah, they, they... Every each side of my head, we've we've got some some trailing it's, uh, no, it's not white them. hoop earrings. It's not them. <laughs> it's the Japanese fans on the wall behind. Oh, yeah. Are... I shouldn't turn my head then. No, no. Yeah. Let's, let's preserve that picture. Look, okay. You let's... love those fans. I You're do. always I mention talking every about time. them. I'm having them. At some point, you go, I'm going to drop into Chicago. I should send You're some. You're going to innocently invite me for dinner and... A couple of days later, you're going to be thinking, What's, there was so, wasn't there something on the wall in here? <laughs> and I'm going to be, ha, 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 like the evil English baddie in a film. I right. like that. Let us crack on with this. Uh, it's a packed episode, this particular one. You have done a cracking case, uh, on a cracking job on the, um, the blurb. So first of all, before we get into that, let me ask you what you thought of what was already there from Nikki. So Nikki's original blurb had some really nice things working for it. Uh, I I do enjoy uh, the hook. Uh, It's got a fun tone to it. He's handsome, wealthy, and oh so mysterious. It's fun. It, it, It makes it so you know that this is not some dark mystery, but, but it also, uh, the hook also sounds potentially like romance. And, and so you have to, uh, you, you have to make sure that when you have a hook like that, it, it's not just fun and games. It's also, uh, doing some lifting for you in, in making sure the reader who finds your page likes that kind of genre. So it, it, it it's tough because there's a lot of good things and we even, cribbed a few phrases yeah a german shepherd at her side uh which is perfect for that um kind of mystery genre female detective with a dog sort of thing but but yeah there's lots of good points of it yeah i mean one thing that's coming across uh from this particular book laboratory experiment is that nikki's a good writer and that comes through Absolutely. in the blurb there. So you've got a, yeah, his, his, the first line then from Nikki's original is he's handsome, wealthy, and oh so mysterious, but you can't judge a book by its cover, right? So your point there is is the one I thought of as well, which is that he's handsome, wealthy, and oh so mysterious could easily be the opening line blurb from a billionaire romance series. Exactly. And you've got to signal, we say this on every book lab, you've got to signal what punters are going to get with your book very clearly. And that perhaps is an unintended consequence of a quite a nice turn of phrase, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it, it, it's good writers can do themselves harm uh, by by not doing uh, giving that cue to the readers, certainly. So you're you're spot on. Now, your blurb is a little bit longer than Nikki's, but we'll try and do it like for like and then uh, as always people can get uh, at selfpublishingformula.com forward slash book lab four can download the before and afters to follow along here but your new top line for the blurb is a rare edition 
a murdered thief. Can a midlife PI solve the case before the killer ending? Textbook, Cohen blurb. Mm-hmm. Cohen book. best page forward style right go. here for you. So let's first of all point out that you have addressed what we picked up with the possible problem of the nicely written top line before is that your top line signals the genre. Yes, it is a mystery, a murder mystery. So we need to know, hey, someone died. We need to know there's a detective who's working on the case. And we need to know, I mean, this is something we always push, uh, which is the we, we need to know that character is in danger. There are real stakes here for uh, for Ronnie Lake to solve this case or she might die. And we have the little bit of a uh, rare book edition killer ending pun in there to try to show the fun that that Nikki showed off in her original line, but but doing it in a slightly more subtle way. Great. Now, Nikki's next line is a 50 something divorcee turned private eye. Ronnie Lake turns the pages on her current case with her beloved German shepherd at her side. Adultery, betrayal and romance are the main characters until murder steals the scene and plunges her into the exclusive world of rare book collecting. Your line, Ronnie Lake has reinvented herself. With her trusty German shepherd by her side, the freshly licensed PI refuses to take her 50s lying down. But Ronnie has a real-life murder mystery on her hands when a dinner party ends with a would-be burglar's demise. So tell me what you did there. So I, once again, I think Nikki's, uh, what she did here is strong. And, and we kind of repackaged it in a different way to... to Give the audience, uh, give the readers a, a little, a little morsel at a time. Uh, it's it's a longer sentence. Her her first that that begins the fifty something divorcee, uh, but we're just saying Ronnie Lake has reinvented herself to to start. We love to give the reader just this sense of a character in a very short period of time and and you'd like to think a lot of readers for this genre might be in their 50s their 60s as well and they're kind of that they get a, an understanding of the reinvention that that comes with divorce and and we don't necessarily mention the divorce here we 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 wondered about that whether or not to include it but i thought just sticking with uh saying that she refuses to take her 50s lying down uh, was was kind of a, a better way to handle that. I think that the way sometimes the reader mind works when looking at a book description, when reading it, is if you put in too much information in a single sentence, it's difficult for them to retain all of it. And that's why Ronnie Lake has reinvented herself. Oh, okay. One piece of inf information versus divorcee, private eye, current case, German shepherd, four pieces of information. So we give these little bite-sized chunks, and then we we try to set the scene a little bit differently uh, than she did with the adultery, betrayal, and romance, kind of going into these big topics versus us saying, real-life murder mystery, it's a dinner party that ends with, wait, a, a person who's trying to steal something dies? That's kind of some interesting intrigue there. And so we, uh, it's very similar, I would say, to what she has. It's just done in a different way to try to not overwhelm the reader, but still to intrigue them at the same time. Yeah. Now, I told you before we started, there was something I really loved about this uh, blurb, and it's in this line. And, and the more I talk to Jenny Nash, and there's a bit of an overlap here in, in terms of learning here about how we present our information and I could hear Jenny applauding the way you've done this because she talks about info dumps a lot and when it, it sort of when you're giving people information it takes them out of the narrative which is a very easy thing to do and we're all guilty of it but here I think you've done this really beautifully so um, where Nikki said a 50 something divorcee turned private eye you've turned that into a sentence that says the freshly licensed PI refuses to take her 50s lying down as you said, I mean, what a what a perfect way of moving you along, but also subtly giving you that little bit of information. And that's the golden key, really, to to that succinct writing. And um, I, I think I would be right in saying that Jenny Nash would be on her feet applauding the way that you've done that. 
Well, that's awesome to hear. I, I still need to meet Jenny, by the way. Yeah, yeah, we've we got to arrange we've, that. We've got to set that up. But yeah, whenever you are including plot in your description, you need to have momentum along with it. You need to keep the momentum going, uh, or else it will take readers out. I absolutely agree with that. Okay, so uh, Nikki's next line in the original verb: "When a priceless first edition vanishes, everyone becomes a suspect." and a target. But a literary shocker speaks volumes about an historic book series curiously lost to time. That holds the key to it all. In your rewrite, you have, after discovering that a rare edition of The Great Gatsby is at the center of the case, Ronnie dives deep into the world of collecting. But when her investigation brings her closer to a rich book connoisseur with an eye for romance, she's unsure if he's a partner or a suspect. So this is, again, this is something you do. You build like a pyramid, don't you, on how much you, you give yourselves a little bit more license to flesh out the story in this third line. Yeah, we, I think that one thing Nikki did that was interesting was she established that there's this kind of romantic interest in her description, but she, she left it in the hook and then didn't necessarily come back to address it. We really, I think, so many great romances, especially these, uh, it's almost got a cozy feel with a dog sidekick and a, and a, and a, a amateur private investigator. It has that cozy feel. And with cozy mysteries, you almost need that will they or won't they romantic interest in there. So we know that readers are interested in that. We've seen that from the series that we've written uh, descriptions for that have been successful. So we had to build that up. But and this is key from from uh, the information Nikki gave us about the book that she's not fully sure if she can trust this this guy. And so we needed to, to bring that up. And this is almost a, an exact rephrase of what she has. Everyone becomes a suspect and a target. But now reframing it in this romantic interest, unsure if he's a partner or a suspect, it makes it more personalized. It makes it more, uh, even though everyone means more people. The stakes are actually higher in our version because it's someone that the reader might care about uh, because they have a connection to uh, the protagonist. Yeah, and it's uh, it's intrigue, isn't it? Which you both both sentences do have, but uh, yes, I like that finishing off with the uh, is he a partner or a suspect? Um, now it's then the last line of Nikki's original, which is. Uh, be sure to enjoy the ebook bonus prequel to Ronnie Lake's story in the first several chapters of Stunner and the beginning of Delilah. Um, now I have to say that was the sentence I liked the least of um, the original. Uh, I, 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 you know, you always do say you've got to say at the end, you know, this is what you <laughs> need to do, buy the book or whatever. Um, I found it a slightly confusing uh, sentence actually to try and try and un un untangle what what's on offer here. I think that. I, Nikki's not the only author I've I've seen fall prey to the thinking that a reader wants bonus content and that that's more important than the story itself, uh, and and that they they they're more likely to buy a book if they know there's a bonus prequel in it, or they're more that maybe that's the case in a box set, uh, but even then it still feels like that's a reason to get. Uh, existing readers. Oh, there's a story I've never read before. I'll, I'll pick up the box set. But for someone who is coming into this fresh, there being this uh, bonus prequel is not going to excite them. I we we in ours we close out with one more cliffhanger line before we get to saying this is the book. <laughs> yeah. This is the book you you are interested in. This is the book you're going to care about more. And so we don't, we, we, we don't even mention. And when we get uh, descriptions from other, uh, uh, from other folks through best page forward, we don't always mention those kinds of bonuses just because we don't think they necessarily sell books. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the added complexity is I, what I found confusing about the sentence is it talks about, um, 
the prequel to Ronnie Lake's story and then talks about two separate books, several chapters from this and several chapters from that. So are they both the prequel to Ronnie Lake? So it's, uh, it's not a, a massively mm -hmm. coherent uh, sentence. It sounds very, very rude of me to say that, but it didn't work for me anyway. Um, and then what, so what you've done, you, at this point, you had carried on with the, uh, the blurb about the, more directly about this book uh, with the line, um, will Ronnie discover the secret behind the novel before the killer shuts the book on her life? I like what you've done there. I'm going gonna, gonna to make you speak now. Now, answer. Right when you I'm drinking. Did that? Yeah, I timed it. The YouTube. Uh, the YouTube audience is getting so much more. you got to subscribe to uh, yes. what's your YouTube channel called again? It is called, if you just search for self-publishing formula, you will find us on YouTube. And, Go subscribe And this is self-publishing formula. I, I don't know if you know, this is part of the relaunch self-publishing show. So this is now the self-publishing show. Um, which Ooh, also I did hear about the, yeah. I did hear about the relaunch. That was very exciting. Um, so, um, congrats. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, it's gone well, so, I think, from the past. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this, uh, this line is we we always try to include this it's so funny i i i was just writing a uh a, a children's book description putting the final touches on it this morning and it makes you think even a children's book has a cliffhanger that you you want to leave the the reader wanting more even if they're a parent just looking for something to help put their kid to sleep at night because uh leaving uh, this goes back to my theater days, my improv days. You always want to leave people wanting more because you want them to come back to the next show. You want them to read the next book uh, before the killer shuts the book on her life. Uh, a little pun, a little bit of a uh, nod to there being a, a lighter tone to this murder mystery and a the, the stakes one more time. It, it, the cliffhanger often ends up being kind of a rephrasing of our hook. Uh, solve the case before the killer ending, before the killer shuts the book on her life. What are the stakes? Why should you read this book? What might happen in this book? Obviously, Nikki isn't going to kill her character. Pretty obvious. But you almost want the reader to know that it could happen. Yeah. And so you, you include that in as, a, as the cliffhanger. And by the way, that is, of course, the mainstay of, uh, of a lot of storytelling. Uh, the fact that people kind of know James Bond is not going to die does not stop us being feeling threatened when he's hanging off a cliff or somebody's holding a gun mm -hmm. to his head. It's not. So you can, of course, you can do that. You can you put your uh, hero... Um, and nobody's going to say, well, they're not going to kill Ronnie really Lake. They're going to see the intrigue and the possibilities of the story. Um, mm -hmm. Great. And then you've got your uh, payoff lines here. Searching for Gatsby is the third standalone book in the Ronnie Lake murder mystery series. If you like realistic female characters, canine sidekicks, and twists you won't see coming, then you'll love Nikki Danforth's suspenseful tale. Buy Searching for Gatsby to start turning the pages today. Don't forget to ask people to buy the book. Yes, I... I... I see back and forth some people saying, hey, calls to action have uh, don't work for me. Calls to action do work for me. We use it. We've seen it help conversions. But as always, look, we have written a lot of book descriptions, but that doesn't mean that uh, we know everything, certainly. You get to see your sales data in real time. You get to see how well your ads are performing test out one for a month test out another for a month make sure the clicks are the number of clicks are, are pretty uh even between them so that you don't accidentally fall prey to the hey this isn't selling when you only sent a quarter of the clicks to it that month the data needs to speak for itself but try one way or the other and see what works best and then Go with the one that works best. Great. And if people do download the before and after, not only do you see the before and after of the main blur, but uh, Brian includes uh, the code version to go on Amazon with a little bit of HTML code for the bolding and paragraphs. Uh, the Facebook ad, which is uh, actually that's got a really good subheadline. Start reading this murder mystery right away. It sounds a really obvious thing to say, but if you're using Facebook ads targeting system well, and this la ad lands in front of people who like reading murder mysteries. What a great 
start reading this murder mystery right away. It doesn't say buy the book, spend the money. It just says, you know, here's a chance to start reading it. And it's, I really like that. And then there are 10 Amazon ad headline options for you. And this is, I guess, part of the service with uh, Best Book Forward, with your blurb service. Mm-hmm. Best Page Best Forward, Page Forward, James. sorry. <laughs> Best Book Forward the no. conglomerates you're going on to, found. Exactly, yeah. No, we, we include all of that because... Uh, we we know how important the advertising is. Obviously, you you guys certainly know that, and uh, we recommend just like testing a line here or there, test different ad copies. No one would ever tell you only create one ad with one set of keywords. Try uh, try a, a boatload of them, ten or more. And then see which one has the best click-through rate, which one's getting you the the best results. And I know Amazon doesn't always make it easy <laughs> to show those, but uh, test different things out and and see which one is going to uh, bring you the best return on investment. Super excellent, Brian. Thank you so much. Another cracking job uh, on the book lab, um, and it's been a good one. This one because the the writing's good. The blurb was good. You've improved it, definitely. Well, something made a noise in my head then. Uh, you've improved it. <laughs> and um, and it, Jenny talked about the writing, which is great. And then the cover, Stuart didn't really like it, and I didn't really like it. And so this, for the first time, we've really got something that uh, we've thought this is, you know, not right and it'd be interesting to hear how nikki uh, responds but i'm so pleased that her writing is brilliant and everyone's excited about that because um i couldn't bear to do three chunks in a row of nikki listening to an interview of people saying yeah this is not good enough so um <laughs> so so you've you've rescued us there by um by well she's rescued herself by doing a good job with the uh, the blurb and the writing yeah no this is definitely one of those where you you feel really good that and and i'm sure you know jenny and stewart feel the same way getting to elevate something uh to another level getting to to make the marketing match or exceed the quality of the book i feel like at this point it's it's matching it because obviously the book is is probably just as strong as her original blurb and and so getting that opportunity to do that and you guys doing this with the book lab to help get authors to have the marketing that their book deserves is such a wonderful thing it's such a wonderful service you guys get to provide so uh, uh my hats my hats my many hats are off to you james tip well that's very kind of you great well i can hear one of those mournful american fire engines Wait. Uh, i wasn't sure if it made it to the it's microphone but it wait. did they sound like the saddest vehicles on earth <laughs> They um, are. But you go off to sleep to them in New York. But uh, there you go. So uh, just in case, another part of your house on fire. We'll let you go. Brian, thank you once again for a sterling job. And we will see you in book lab number five at some point in the future. I can't wait, James. Thanks for having me. This is the self-publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Okay, there you are. There's Brian. And Brian, again, was handed a pretty good blurb to start with, but he definitely made it better. And we're going to hear, finally, in this uh, uh, super long edition of the uh, self-publishing show, we're going to hear from Nikki herself and what she thought about all this feedback uh, in a moment. Um, but the blurb again, Mark, and it was a really interesting first moment. It's a great opportunity to hammer this point home again, that your blurb must reflect your genre. And the first line of the blurb, and it was, it was so obvious once Brian pointed out but Nikki didn't see it until it was pointed out that it sold the book as a romance and, and it's not a romance um, so you've just got to, you've just got to make sure each line reinforces what it is the the reader's going to get yeah it's, it's very important so um, and again it's not an easy it's not an easy um, task for an author to pull off sometimes it is necessary to step out of yourself and um, well look at others in your genre that are selling well and all think about asking someone else to do it for you because it is very difficult to divorce yourself from the 80,000 words that you've written and then distill that down into a punchy bite-sized chunk um, which Brian is very good at doing so um, yes very interested to see what he, what he had to say 
And I think I mentioned to Brian, I really loved the way he came up with that line. Uh, the freshly licensed PI refuses to take her 50s lying down. So he's very poetically and easily and comfortably giving you quite a lot of information about the character and the person. But mm-hmm. instead of it being an info kind of stop and start, oh, she's in her 50s and she's divorced. It's a, just a flowing sentence that tells us more about the character than simply that she's 50s and divorced, a bit sassy character that she is. Yeah. Great. So the before and after blurb included with the handout for this episode. So finally, you've probably guessed that if it wasn't the blurb and it wasn't the editorial feedback, it may have been the cover that didn't go down well with our experts. So let us hear about the cover for Searching for Gatsby from our cover design expert, Stuart Bache. This is the self-publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Welcome back to the podcast. Uh, we should just say you do still live on a building site, and occasionally I do. the um, the tip trucks, like the opening scene from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, where they come <laughs> to uh, plow Arthur Dent's house down to make way for a bypass. Uh, well, they, I hope they don't do that. No, no, they're building houses, aren't they? Where you are? Yes, they are. Yeah, rather than the well, other end. Yeah. But it's quite just whilst we were chatting before this, it was quite noisy. So I'm pointing it out. Yeah, if uh, people shouldn't be alarmed. If anyone's out walking yeah. the dog, they'll be looking around like this, thinking that the, uh, <laughs> yeah. the JCBs. I apologise. I apologise. Um, it's not my fault. No, it's not your fault. You don't have to apologise. Okay, lovely to have you back on the podcast, and we are looking at uh, Nikki Danforth's searching for Gatsby. So we are talking talking about the cover and um well what do you think of the cover Stuart um I'm a nice guy always remember I'm a nice guy (laughs) but it 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 needs uh, a lot of work um I think I think the best thing I could say about it the most positive thing I could say about it is that the the image itself so the 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 character uh, and the building and the sky and everything is, isn't at, that bad at all. Uh, it, it, it sort of suits the genre in in, in many ways. Um, however, the, the the actual composition itself is 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 lacking. So it's. I, I think uh, I, it made me feel that perhaps she had uh, Nikki had designed it herself, which isn't a bad thing. If she has, that's that's amazing um, because you know it's it's not an easy job. Um, but there are aspects to it that are a little naive. So, um, for example, the bars that are at the top and the bottom. So there's a green bar at the top and a, a sort of blue bar at the bottom. Um, these sort of overlap the image. If you can't see it, if you if you're not able to to view it, um, and you're listening, it sort of overlaps the image to sort of crops it into like a little square. The image into a square in the middle, um, and that is. A kind of a non-fiction thing that you do with non-fiction but it's also something that you do um, if you don't know how to add type to an image it's a sort of really lazy way of of designing something you know uh, I'm, I'm trying to be as positive as yes. possible because it's it's I mean, not a, it's not a bad I've seen bad yes, covers so it's seen bad covers it's not a bad cover but, but there, is, I mean, there cover. is some type on the on the image so but in terms of the title that is quite a specific thing of how to do that make it stand out well look I'll, I'll put you your, your ease a little bit because you're out on a limb and being you know we've given you a cover that is more challenging to talk about here but um i'll also say with all due respect to nikki and i, and I can tell you with the comfort of knowing that jenny really likes her writing and thinks she's talented mm. and is great this cover does definitely doesn't work for me at a at first glance it doesn't work for me doesn't say it looks a bit like a sort of school textbook I that's got, what I mean by non-fiction yeah, you know, O-level sort of, textbook yeah. um, or uh, maybe uh, an old penguin that's been put together again from a 19th century novel and issued to students at university it doesn't yeah. say a modern exciting witty all the things the book is at all to me um, and that's regardless of the of the technical ability that's gone into creating it which um, is, is well beyond me um, so yeah we've both been you know it's for, for us at least as two people it, it doesn't work for us so let's talk a bit more technically about why you think that's the case now you said first of all the banding um, is it, you know hasn't worked in this case is given it the wrong look uh, is there a place for that kind of banding top and bottom or is that as you say um, non-fiction yeah, I, I mean, banding. I, I, like I say, it always feels like lazy design to me because it's it's an easy way of placing stuff on you know over an image rather than having to deal with how to incorporate type with an image, um, and especially in this genre, you don't get a huge amount of banding. Um, 
uh, it's it, for me. It's like um, when people add really, really hard drop shadows to type to make them stand out because it forces it to stand out against it, and it just looks doesn't look like it should be there. And everything in design should work together. It should sort of help each other. So when you're designing a book cover, you think about where the type's going to go, and you think where the image is going to go. You don't, you know, and this is what a lot of people do. They find the perfect image. And then they try and squeeze the type in somewhere. So you see it like slot, slotted in at the top or at the bottom, wherever they can get it because they love the image so much. So with something like this, I think, um, you know, that I, th- I think it would be worth starting again. I mean, if she can't start again, then I would just go with the image that is, that's in the center here and, and work with that and add some, uh, if there is any more image, because at the moment it's a square. So if there's any more to the bottom or the top, um, if or if she can go back to a designer and uh, and perhaps expand the sky a little bit so that she can add some type up in there. I think um, in terms of um, of styling, there are sort of two directions that you could go, and the, the two sort of more popular ones at the moment are very similar to the sort of action psycholo- um, action sorry thrillers like Marx and Lee Child is that there's a lot of mysteries, murder mysteries have a character walking into a scene and that is kind of, that is what the cover does. Yep. So it does have that. And then, uh, and you know, you have like, I think, I guess the actual books out there that you could emulate are, are the sort of Cormoran Strikes series, you know, the, um, uh, is it Galbraith, the, well, the JK Rowling um, uh, um, uh, thriller mystery. So that's one direction, and then the other side is uh, J.R. Ellis, the, the you know Yorkshire mystery murder mysteries, you know, sort of more on the sort of side of uh, Agatha Christie, uh, that kind of thing. Even though those are set in the past, the the book covers these days are actually quite modern and um, uh, uh, use a scene. So they have a scene like a like a manor house, very similar to this, or. Um, uh, something foreboding, like the the scene of where the murder took place, that sort of thing is really popular in this genre. Um, but in terms of uh, typography, you know, uh, this looks like Avant Garde, which is someone that you can get from your most computers. I think it comes with most PCs and stuff. It says to me something very nineteen twenties. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Um, and this is a very modern book. Although there's a Gatsby. Uh, Reference. And then it does say Gatsby. It does say Gatsby. Um, but it makes me think of the 1920s, the typeface yeah. and the title. Um, actually, I think generally in this in this genre, it's either a, a very kind of um, dynamic sans serif like. Uh, uh, Helvetica uh, or, or something like that you know if you look at the Cormoran Strike series it's a very cool dynamic way they use the typography but for this I think this is the direction she'll probably go which is more along the lines of the classical murder mystery would be to use like a really nice um, serif a really sharp serif like um, Garamond something like that um I uh, actually the J.R. Ellis um, who who who's, who's done really well. I think he's he's done by Amazon. I think it's Thomas and Mercer or someone like that. Um, really bold colours, but it's really sharp. It actually probably is Garamond when I've looked at it before. But if you look it up, um, that's the sort of thing. It kind of sets it in a nice sort of. I know, uh, a Midsummer Murders kind of feel to it and I think that's the kind okay. of direction you want to go when, when you want to come across something like this as, as I always say with book covers you want to know instantly what you're getting yes. and with a cover like this you don't know instantly what you're going to get it could be espionage it could be set in the 1920s it could be like you say a textbook for school it could be all sorts of different things so I think trying to get that down uh, uh, trying to get the genre down first and which direction or what part of that genre you want to because it's you know uh, murder mysteries and thrillers yes. and all sorts of things there's so <laughs> many different ways of doing it you know um, second only to romance I think in terms of uh, yeah exactly uh, yeah. Um, so if you took away the banding uh, the picture was full frame I was going to ask you one technical question about that so if that picture mm. if there's let's assume there's not much more of it um, of that picture at least at least in height could you use the cloning tool or something in Photoshop to increase the amount of clouds at the top, or would that look? Would you, you need could, high degree of skill to do that? You'd need skill to do the cloning tool. A cloning tool is really good for very small things, okay. so it's for, good for like getting rid of little titchy bit, bits, titchy little bits of pieces. But the, um, um, 
But with something like this, what you could do is, if you don't have uh, a means of buying any more, if you, if you can't go back to your design or whatever, right there you have the information. So you have uh, the clouds in the sky. So what you could do is duplicate that layer, make it larger, overlay it to the top, okay. and then sort of use a soft brush to get rid of the, you know, the to delete yeah. the join. Um, that would help. Um, otherwise, you know, just go find a new sky. Well, you must end up with two moons. Because that would be a science no, exactly, fiction. Yeah. Uh, no, yeah. that's okay, true. so that's why. And then at the bottom, I guess that's even more straightforward because that's very linear and repetitive yeah. already at the bottom, isn't it? So you could yeah. presumably yeah. find you could, a way. You could probably use a clone tool on something like that if okay. you wanted to, just okay. for bits and pieces. But, and, um, and then yeah. that by itself, and then you've got to find a way of, of putting the title over the, uh, the picture. Um, and you've covered that that sort of thing before. And if people haven't taken it, we should plug the webinar that you and I did, which does go into detail of how to do all of this yeah. thing which is I should always remember this before we go on air I think it's selfpublishingformula.com uh, forward slash design let me just check that or is that the course that might be the course that's the course <laughs> cover design this is brilliant professional radio isn't it uh, radio podcasting I should probably know myself it's cover design selfpublishingformula.com forward slash cover design there is a webinar um, which uh, goes into Stuart actually demonstrates how to do all of this step by step so um, mm. worth looking at if you want to know the detail but we're definitely talk about it in broad terms at the moment um, so you, you let's get the picture full frame across the whole thing you then put that um, uh, you know the text top and bottom on there and I think that immediately starts to make a significant improvement for me in terms of glancing at it and knowing what it's about yeah, I think um, that would definitely help. Um, I think, I think you know the, the the title would work much better if it, it if it felt a little bit more modern. And I think um, uh, a bright color like a yellow yellow works very well with blues um, or, or orange that sort of color um, would work really really well and make it feel a bit more modern. So um, that you're not sort of once again feeling like you're back in the 1920s again. Uh, but something like Garamond, uh, f uh, um, Adobe Garamond, uh, a really sharp serif would work really, really well and, um, and and maybe put the title onto three lines. So searching for Gatsby on three lines. Okay. What do you think of the blue wash that's been put across the uh, the photo or the image? Um, I, I it, it feels... I think it's okay if you don't if you didn't have those bars i think the color of of your type or or whatever could just sort of sort of bring a bit more depth to it um i mean i have done you know this that these sorts of color washes are are used in this sort of area sometimes i i would say that um uh, some of the Ag Agatha, Christ Agatha Christie's I've worked on in the past, or when I when I worked at HarperCollins, had had more color in because, say, for, say for a manor, for example, like in in this image, um, the lights, the yellow lights against it really help kind of bring a bit of warmth, but also bring in that kind of sense of, you know, that foreboding, like what what's in there. It's night time, there's lights on, and this person's walking towards it on their own yes. you know, that, that would add some really kind of cool yes. depth and yeah. and uh, uh, a, an interest to the cover so yes some colours would be nice in there if, if, if you can put them in um, it's interesting shading and light in that image actually there's quite a lot going on isn't there with um, darker areas and they're almost sort of spotlit raised well, exposure the, moon, the moon's not as bright as it could be and I don't know why that is but um, but you know and her shadow is sort of her shadow's not that bad. I can see what they've what they're trying to do, and she's been cut out very well. Um, but um, I'm not sure. I, the I think does the shadow make logical sense for where the moon is? If if that's well, presumably not, not, not really. I mean, the, but the moon isn't very bright either, so it doesn't no. seem like that's a source of light. So it, okay. it's when, when I talk about composition, this is the things that I mean. You know, like if yeah. this, the, if there's a shadow, it has to come from somewhere. Yeah. It kind of looks good, the shadow, but yes. if the light was coming from the right way, um, and actually it isn't coming from the right way because if you look at the the bushes on either side, the bush to her right, there's a deep dark shadow to that side, which means the light is coming from the right hand side. So really a shadow should be short and to the left, but that's just like me being really nitpicky. But those are the sort of things you do when you design. You look at the things yeah. of where you think the source is. If you can't see it, then the shadows on other things will tell you where it is. Yeah. Um, but this is me being really picky. I mean, the thing, the big thing for me that I found really interesting because I did look at the blurb because I wanted to get an idea of, of trying to get an idea of what 
what the story was about um, because he didn't tell me instantly and I didn't want to say oh this should look like this when then read the blurb and it's actually super modern and it's nothing to do with the 1920s which was the case but one of the first lines that sort of stands out is but you can't judge a book by its cover right yeah. and <laughs> and I thought it was really interesting because you really shouldn't have things like that on your book anyway because it, the first thing it does it makes you think what do I think about this cover yes um, and <laughs> And, and when it's on a cover like this, it does make you think, okay, I'm not sure this is right at all. And there is something that I should point out before, and I should have pointed out earlier. Um, you don't need to have by on your front cover. Everyone knows if you're the author, then we know it's by you. Um, yes. Okay. I think it's an old fashioned thing to do. A lot of people used to do in, um, you know, about 30, 40 years ago, but you don't need to have by on there. Um, okay. So. So I, I don't know whether Nikki designed I will talk to her, obviously, after she's watched all these interviews. Uh, hopefully she'll take it in the spirit it's offered. Um, I'm sure she will. Uh, I don't know whether she designed this herself or a friend did it or something. It doesn't doesn't look like a pro design to me. So I kind of, sort of put you on the spot a little bit, Stuart, and say how much would it cost somebody like Nikki to get a cover designed by someone like you? Uh, by me? Um it, you, you, you're looking at something like between 300 to 400 pounds, which is quite, you know, I, I'm on the more expensive end of things, um, but you can get some fantastic covers um, and, and fantastic pre-made covers for, you know, $99 yeah. um, uh, and uh, up to 150 Um And I, I think I would, I would always recommend an author, if, if they don't have a huge amount of budget for a cover, which is understandable. They are they are one of the most expensive things. Uh, you know, as Mark and and you know that it's it's always it's something that you sh- you shouldn't worry about too much because a bad cover will actually you know affect you so much and it's a it's a good investment. Yeah. Um, but um, I, I would always suggest to an author to, if they haven't got a big budget is to go and get a pre made cover rather than try and do it themselves. I know that we've got the course and everything. Yes. If you can do the course, that's cool. But if you if you are if you're doing something now, and you need to get your book out there, then a pre-made cover is is better than you tinkering around. Um, unless you've learned um, how to do it yourself properly and understand the genre, then. Um, yeah, so we've, um, you know, we say this all the time, the, the cover is so critically important and uh, there are people who enjoy doing their own covers and are good at it and we've seen them in the groups, uh, in your group in particular, and some have gone on to be designers for other people. Um, but you do need to be wanting to be that person and uh, and have a you know good degree of training and talent at it. If you think you're not that person, then surely that 300 quid and you're the high end of it is is going to be a good investment um if you're serious about your career and and making money and particularly i would think at the beginning you know you could because at the beginning you don't really know some of the fundamentals you've talked about that need to be in place for this book and its genre that will come naturally to a good designer so you could pay for that one cover and then maybe from that point onwards you've got a, you're really clued in as to what the cover needs to look like and what it needs to say maybe that's the point at which you then try and do your own ones after that but um to try and not well, only do yeah. you know do it technically yourself but also all the editorial decisions that you make very naturally uh, don't come naturally to other people no but the, but the, you know le, le, you might not be able to do uh, to learn necessarily to pick up how to design it perfectly yourself but um there are ways of learning how to um, uh, to understand your genre. The research, all of that sort of stuff, doesn't require you to be a, a, a you know a, a pro designer or, or, or you know to, to be able to find your designer is, is great and to work with a pro is, is is even better. But it from the very beginning, you as an author should understand your your genre and what works and what doesn't. You know, we often talk about you know familiarity theory and stand out and all that kind of stuff. Those things are really really important right at the beginning of your career because if you don't respect those things because this is this is you this is you this is part of you this is your face this cover is your face as an author and if it's bad people aren't necessarily going to get delve into your brilliant work and as yeah. you said you know the, the, um it, it, it's a really good book and she's talented so it's it, it's a shame and that that's what happens um, and when people say, you know, you don't judge a book cut by its cover, it, that's that's obviously yeah. it's a, a massive lie because otherwise I'd be out of a job. Yeah, and this, um, this this book, you're quite. This book needs to be seen and read. And Jenny was, um, you know, 
squealing at, at the whole conceit of the 50 something divorcee woman as being the heroine of the book she thinks it's absolutely perfect and crying the world's crying out for this type of thing now so a lot is right with this book but we i'm afraid nikki we have to give this a uh, 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 kind of a miss hooter on this one so uh, but that's good that she's got something valuable yeah, you, to you, work on when you're at the bottom you've only got one way to go you <laughs> oh, know. at the bottom the knife well, went, you know, the knife okay, was in. Maybe not you, at the you, you just no, turned the it. Nikki's. Oh. Yeah, I'm, I'm, terribly, I'm terribly sorry. It, it's a British thing. I'm going to flirt. I'm going to get all uh, hot now, and, and you know. I know you're wrong. I apologise, Nikki. It's not. It's not it's right only, at the bottom, but you know, but yes. you have so much potential, and it's it's there anyway. So I think this. You know, this, you've got the story. All you need is um, a great a good design. And a good designer, so superb, Stuart. Thank you. I can hear the uh, JCB coming, so we'll yeah, it's on its way. We'll quit it's now. It's coming to crash through the, yeah. the wall, I think, in a minute. <laughs> the bypass is on its way. <laughs> this is the self publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Stuart was not alone, was he, Mark, in not really liking that cover? No, I didn't love it either, which is probably why the um, I chose Nikki for this one because I thought that Stuart could. Um, could do some good work on this one. Um, so, yeah, interested to see how see what he, he felt about that. Of course, Nikki's got a problem now because she's got three, I think, three books in the series, all with the same design. And she's yeah. complete. Well, in fact, I'll tell you what, before I talk about that, why don't we f- sum up this episode by hearing from Nikki herself about what she thought of the feedback? And then I'll tell you about her problem in terms of how she goes forward now. So let's hear what Nikki Danforth, the author, thought of these expert opinions in the book lab. This is the self-publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Okay, Nikki, why don't you start before we hear what you thought about what you heard? Just tell us in succinct terms who Nikki Danforth is. Well, Nikki Danforth spent a lot of years working in television, just like you, James. And at a certain point, sort of wound down out of that career as a director and a producer in the field on television and then in, in the corporate world and had always had a fantasy of writing and just decided to give it a go. And my first book was my first Ronnie Lake, Stunner. Learned a lot and very quickly met a wonderful editor. Can't imagine doing a book without her. So that's how I got here. I just decided new chapter in life, kind of like Ronnie Lake, and to give it a go. That's Can I ask a personal question? Are you? Yes. Is there a divorced element as no, well? No, you know. Okay, the, I mean, I wouldn't normally ask somebody that, but obviously, it's a key factor, and it was something that you st- talk about good editors. So let's start with Jenny, because Jenny was yes. really taken with that. Cause she just thinks it's a very not not zeitgeist. I think Jenny just thought it's a very everyday thing. You know, that's what we we invent our heroes to all be usually a little bit too perfect. And here's yes. somebody who's recovering from a very typical life time experience and she thought it was great well what i really appreciated that jenny liked is is where ronnie is in her life she's midlife she's the next chapter of her life and it's not just that she's divorced the divorce happened for a very tragic reason all of this is in the first book which is kind of a prequel in terms of how does somebody decide to become a private investigator? They don't just wake up one day and say, I want to be a private investigator, or rarely does that happen. It happens for various other reasons. And Ronnie had been downsized out of her corporate job in television distribution in Manhattan. So she was out of a job. She um, had tragically lost, she and her husband had lost their son in Afghanistan. And he, he was a war dog handler and warrior whom she adopted was the last living being with their son so that's why warrior is so dear to ronnie yeah the marriage could not withstand the death of their son that's why the divorce happened she's also an empty nester with two other adult daughters so it's divorce no job the death of one of her children, she's ready for a new chapter. And she gets pulled in accidentally 
into an investigation concerning another member of her family in the first book. And she discovers that she really likes doing this, working on this, and uh, decides to give it a go. And in the second book, which is really a long, short story and was part of an anthology, she's learning, she's taking classes, she's working for the PI that she hired in the first book, learning the methods of investigation and everything that goes into being a PI. And in the third book, Searching for Gatsby, she is now a newly licensed private investigator. And this becomes her first real case on her own. Okay, so what a great character fleshed out and you brought life to uh, to Ronnie Lake, layered and textual and motivated and all the things that we want in our characters. So what did you think of the feedback you heard from, from Jenny? Well, I loved, I loved her comments because they were all right on the money. And what I appreciated was that she was really focusing in on some things that are so easy for any writer to miss. First of all, I couldn't disagree at all about the endings, the endings that she referred to in my introduction and in the first, first chapter and then she referred to getting it right at the end of the second chapter. I get to the end of a chapter and I often say, I need something with a little more sizzle here and I can't figure it out and I just cut. <laughs> yeah, so I thought it was a really, it was a great bit of feedback, wasn't it? Because there's it something It was a great bit of feedback of and it's something that I can go back in and take a look at and do because she talks about that it's a great way to ramp up the momentum and keep driving your story forward. So I thought that was fantastic. Um, she also talked about that passive, how it's easy to fall into a passive voice. You don't even realize it. And again, she referred to that transition when the old guy in the introduction changes to his cat burglar outfit and I say he's transformed. She wanted to see much more detail about that, even yeah. if it's just a sentence or two. And I thought, okay, I'm going to have to go back and take a look at that and see what I can do with it. Um, yeah. I'm very much looking forward to seeing her PDF that she referred to. It's her uh, chapter uh, audit that you can do oh, per yeah, chapter. The, chapter, the one hour chapter order and the hierarchy of editorial concerns. So I'll send as a, as a treat. Yeah. <laughs> you, you get you. those straight away. I'll send no, those I to thought, you. After you know, this interview. I could go through and, and use yeah. that. That sounds like a really good Definitely. workable document. And that point that, she made about the transformation goes to the yeah. heart of what Jenny talks about a lot is, is, is don't, info dump don't tell people yes. things but use something to to that it tells the reader what's going on that and that's what she she saw in that him changing was the perfect yes. opportunity to flesh out his character as he yes. changed into this person yeah and then i tell you james i had to really laugh when she looked at my two little mini info dumps after listening to this the last book lab where she talked quite a bit about info dumps and I had started to send you materials for my book lab. I went into my look inside feature and I was rereading it and I came to, I run my fingers through my shoulder length, straw colored hair yeah. as my left foot. And I went, oh my God, Nikki, that yeah. is an info dump phrase if I've ever seen one, but I promised I wouldn't touch anything. So yeah. <laughs> I left it alone. I couldn't disagree either. And those can really, they can slip in easily. It's really you almost easy, need distance from your book to go back after a while and yes. these things pop out at you. So. Yeah. Well, that's why traditional publishers might take two and a half years yeah. to go yeah. rewrite the book several times. Yes. Um, now, here's a question for you. So changing the blurb and the cover is one thing, which we'll come on to in a moment. But are you going to rewrite a lot of this book, do you think? Or are you going to take these, these hints and tricks forward with your new writing? I think right now at the moment, I'm going to apply them moving forward because I've got two in the works and I don't want to lose momentum there. And then I, my goal here really is to get a, a, a bigger backlist of these Ronnie Lake books so that I can start applying to applying the strategies that you teach, that uh, Mark and you teach throughout self-publishing formula 
that work so much better when you've got 10 books in a series. Yeah. And so that's really my goal and my focus now is to work on Ronnie Lake. Okay, so let's move on to the blurb then. And uh, again, I think for the third time in a row, Brian looked at your blurb and thought, pretty good job. But I think he made it better. What did you think? He made it better without a doubt. I've been following Brian's work on all of these book labs. And because I thought he was so amazing and what he produced was so amazing, I hired Brian to rewrite the blurbs for my children's books. And they were, they're terrific and they're performing well on Amazon. So I was thrilled to have this opportunity and know that he would be rewriting Searching for Gadsby as well. I like everything he's done with it. And he did. I mean, I was really taken with some of the uh, the turns of phrases that he yes. came up with. The the way that he got the information over. Uh, I mean, he is a wordsmith. There's no question about it. In the way that he uh, uh, he and his team come up with this. Well, he hit the genre right at the top, and I really did not do that. Uh, he was right. It it could have been a little more. Is this a romance book? Yes. And he got that was- the mystery genre right away. That was probably the key criticism of it. Yes. Uh, everything else was 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 margins, but he did think, and that's such an important thing. That first yes. line's got to tell people what this genre is, and yeah, yes. So that did come across a bit of as a romance. Yeah. Now his turn of phrase, uh, she wasn't going to take her fifties lying down, which is a a really nice way of of telling you who the person is and making it sound appealing at the same time as a and that uh, she's not twenty two years old. Yeah. She's fifty five. So yeah. And and I I've not been sure of doing that on my page on Amazon because I thought, am I going to turn away readers, even though I populate these books with a lot of younger characters? My main character is this midlife woman starting a new chapter in her life that a lot of baby boomers can relate to. And he completely embraced it and put it out there in, I think, a perfect way. So you're going to adopt this blurb? Unfettered. Yes, I'm going to use ex- every word that he's put there. I'm, I'm yeah. going to put it in onto my it, uh, sales page. And it's a great and, um, package you get because you get all the Amazon lines and yes. uh, headlines as well, which you can yes. use. So uh, good. Yeah, that was a definite hit from um, from Brian. But when we come like to the cover, he, oh, sorry, go on. I like that he also talks about. He, he bookends with the hook at the top and he brings it back to that at the end. I like how he tries to build intrigue for the reader. Yeah, there's, it, it was perfection. So I'm, I'm very excited about that. Yeah, well, let's see what difference it makes. That's the key thing. So we'd love to hear about that in the future. Now, finally, one area where there was not uh, universal praise, uh, which was the cover. And I have to say, and I said it on the interview, I I wasn't a a fan of the the cover either. So I'm sorry about that. And Stuart feels mortified that he was, he's such a nice guy, Stuart, unlike me. I'm happy to criticize anyone I'm not. Uh, But Stuart was like, oh my God, I'm going to have to say something here. But he didn't think it worked. Uh, So how did you feel? Feel about that because it's always difficult, isn't it, when you hear hear that kind well, of criticism? Well, I'll tell you, I can relate to the earlier book lab participants who all acknowledge nerves when the time came to listen to the takes from the different experts. Because when you sent this to me, and I saved it for the morning, I got up, I got a cup of coffee, I said, do I read my New York Times first or do I go upstairs and look at these videos? I was nervous, I had butterflies. So, and I started with Stewart's first. Oh, you did, you know, I put it in the other order for you and I I hoped, did you see that I'd, I'd, Cunningly, put I, it, I know so that you would did, be the last but I thing. didn't know if maybe you were changing the order of this one. So I just started there, and I went, "Okay, let's just listen." I didn't panic. I listened. I took notes all the way through, and then I just stopped. And fortunately, somewhere along the way, you acknowledged, or you both talked about the fact that Jenny had given me really it had been such a positive evaluation so i listened to it i stopped i went to the other ones i listened to jenny i listened to brian and i said i said i'm gonna sleep on this and so the next day 
I went to SPF University and I watched the one that you did with Stuart because I wanted to find out more. And, um, and I was wowed by that. And I was wowed by those montages showing genres because it seems that I really missed the boat on the genre with my cover. So looking at those screens that, that you talked about and referred to at SPF University, showing the different genres really hit home for me. I also love listening to him talk about the fonts, talk about the way he combines images. Um, everything about it, that Facebook group at the end, some of those covers in there, it just blew me away. And so I, I finished watching that. And this was not a do-it-yourself cover, James. I worked with a designer. The first one actually got a pretty good response. And um, it even won an honorable mention in a cover contest online. I can't remember whose contest it was, but it, it, it had a pretty good, got a pretty good response. And then I was sort of trying to stay with the look of the series. Sure. And again, I remember one of your other um, book lab participants talking about designing a cover, trying to keep in mind the thumbnails, you know, the size of the thumbnails. And so, you know, I had the bands with the titles and that you could read easily. But I, I, I can't disagree. I wrote the whole list. I started thinking about, can I just take what I've got on this cover and make these adjustments but I'm going to have to do that with the other two. Or is this, a, is this really an opportune time since I anticipate having two books coming out first half of 2019? Is this really a more appropriate time to rethink it from scratch? Um, and I need to think more about that. I don't have an answer or solution yet, but I can't. It surprised me. Yeah, <laughs> I'm open. Well, it's, it's 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 great because uh, Mark and I do see from time to time some people who just don't have the art of taking criticism and argue back about it, and you just think, yeah, it's going to be difficult to make real progress in life if you don't take on board uh, valuable advice. I mean, and not everything you're going to be told is going to be uh, worthwhile, but everything requires an evaluation. I think it's brilliant the way that you've uh, done that. All James, if I was have. going to blow something, thank goodness it wasn't the writing. I'd much yeah. rather blow the cover. <laughs> And, you know, the, the writing is where it all starts, right? Yeah, the book. So absolutely. the and cover is something I can fix. A really strong positive for you is, is the feedback you got on the writing and the cover you can fix. And so um, yes. I should just mention, because you mentioned the SPF University um, webinar. That, so that's available for people who have taken one of our courses or are Patreon supporters of this podcast. So it's a bit closed off. Uh, SPF University, but there is a version of that webinar out in the public domain, and you can jump on that if you go to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash cover design. And I think you're vouch for this. Uh, it's a really excellent webinar. I, Stuart goes into all the genres, explains why they work, why they yes. don't work when you get yes. things wrong, and then goes on to show you how to actually create a cover or how it's created in, in Photoshop. If you either want to be interested now, in they do their job, or you yourself want to have a go, it's useful to understand that. One thing I wanted to mention, Stuart encouraged me to look at certain covers by certain authors, which I did. He mentioned um, Robert Galbraith. I, I have all those books. And I looked at those covers. A little bit more difficult for me to go straight from those. They use a variety of fonts. It's But you've got that the running man idea uh, on on quite a number of those covers where you don't really see specifically, you feel the danger. Um, yeah. He said to take a look at J.R. Ellis, and I took a look at L.J. Ross, who was who was interviewed in a podcast not that long ago, and I see what he's talking about in terms of the genre. When you look at all of those covers, the genre grabs you right away, and I realize my cover does not do that, so. Uh, actually, um, L.J. Ross 
was such an inspiring story, too. She did the rare thing of hitting a home run with her first book, and which I've now downloaded onto my Kindle. I want to see what you know, see see this world that she's created. So, but her covers also communicate quite clearly the genre, and yeah. uh, I can do so, better on that. So critical and becoming more critical in the uh, more crowded market, um, and that's. Uh, a potential financial problem for you, Nikki, because of course you've got a series of books and changing all the covers in one go yeah. is, you know, if that's 500 bucks a cover, that's, you know, adds yeah. up pretty quickly. Uh, so what and do you think you're going to do? that's not having Stuart. If you have Stuart, yeah. it's probably more than double that. So. No, I think you can get Stuart for 500 bucks. I think you can get Stuart. Oh. Um, I think I'm right well. in saying he's just, he's just nudged his prices, but not by very much, by about $50, but um, he's worth every penny. I keep telling him he needs to double his his fees but uh, well james anyway. yeah. <laughs> hold on there <laughs> yeah. you get him first well he's not going to so. okay um but anyway that's still you know it's four books in the series is that right well there are three and i've got two that i'm working on so it'll be five so you oh, are talking about it, over a thousand dollars most likely to change the covers is that something you're going to do in the near future i have to i have to process all of this i have yeah. to think about it there are moments when you do have large investments right yeah um it's an it's it's very important i i need to sleep on that one a bit yes, more and make the decision whether to take the big dive again those books are happening a little bit into 2018 so maybe that i can spread it out a bit i don't yeah. have to I'll have them all pop in at one S time santa for money this year Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, Nikki, it's been terrific talking to you. I'm so pleased that uh, that the feedback was useful to you. Um, and uh, you're, you've seemed to me like you've got a list of things that you're going to take away from this process, which is what we want the book lab to be. I do, James. Thank you very much for selecting my book to be one of, one of your book labs. You get so much out of these. I got a lot out of watching the others. And I hope uh, everybody who watches gets a lot out of this one. The experts are all amazing. And uh, I have loads of things I can do to make my books better. Thank you. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. There we go. There's Nikki, who once again demonstrated why people in our community are so brilliant and so many of them are so successful because they take that criticism on board. They understand the value of it and they move forward with it. And Nikki was um, she was nervous. She said, I think she said in the interview, she was nervous about it. She put some time aside and was dreading it a little bit, but then was heartened to hear some of the positive stuff and found it incredibly useful to hear some of the more critical stuff, particularly the covers. So so she's got three or four books in the series and she needs to redo the covers for all of them. Um, she just doesn't have to. I and mean, that's as uh, is course is up to her, but I mean, I would, I would recommend it. I thought the covers out of all the, the elements that I looked at were the weak link. And they're probably the most important part of the, the trifecta to get someone into the, into the actual writing. And, and unfortunately I've mentioned this before, the actual writing itself is come some way down the line. You've got to hook them first of all, when they're, um, when the reader is uh, assailed by, lots of choice on Amazon. Uh, so you get them to click onto the product page. There's probably the cover doing that. It definitely is if you're using an Amazon ad. Once they're on the, the page, you've got to hook them with the blurb and that provided you can get through those two barriers, then you then you have the, the task of enticing them once they start reading to continue with the book, which becomes an investment of time at that point rather than an investment of money, um, and then to take them into the rest of the series. So it is, it's, it's extremely important. And I, I thought... You know, that that was I didn't like those covers either, and I'm I'm certainly not as expert as Stu is, but um, but I am a reader, um, and and that's uh, you know, and I, I'm also I've got a fairly good idea about covers now after being doing this for such a long time, um, and yeah, it's 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 good that Stu got so involved in that one. There you go. Okay, now you can download uh, the PDFs to go along with this episode if you go to selfpublishingshow.com forward slash book lab four and uh, included in that not only the original cover and the original before and after blurbs, but um, uh, of great value is what Jenny Nash has presented for us, the hierarchy of editorial concerns PDF and the one hour chapter audit. 
And if you would like to be inside the laboratory being dissected by our experts, uh, you have to become a Patreon supporter of this podcast. So you can go to patreon.com forward slash self-publishing show. Now note that is a new URL for our Patreon supporters. It's the same Patreon account. Nothing changes there. If you are a supporter already, don't panic. Uh, but to see your account, you will need to go to patreon.com forward slash self-publishing show and you can support us for as little as a dollar an episode. And I think we're wearing our value now, aren't we, with our new cameras and sound and uh, a fantastic new intro. And so that's all been enabled by the support that we receive from you, our dear listener. We are, and, and also thanks to everyone who commented so nicely about the uh, the new um, the new look of the podcast uh, for the 150th episode last week. So we got plenty of YouTube um, love, which was was great. I will just recommend, actually, um, as my mother calls me, hello, mum, on, on my phone. Yeah. Uh, I'll speak to you later, mum. Um, one of the things I would recommend is that you subscribe to the YouTube channel. So go over to YouTube, um, hit that bell icon beneath the video, because as we move into 2019, we do have some interesting ideas for the YouTube channel. So a lot of free content there. Um, we have actually recruited someone as our first full-time employee, uh, kind of, um, and he'll be starting um, next next year. We've got some, we'll, we'll introduce you properly to him as, as we get going, but we're going to have regular content with me, James, and maybe a few others, and it'll be useful stuff too. I may do some stuff on craft that I don't normally talk about. Uh, we'll certainly have marketing and, and promotion and that kind of stuff, and that will be regular probably three times a week we'll have something going up live on the channel so um, do get over there and and hit subscribe if you want to uh, be notified when we've got new stuff going live good and what's the last thing we need to say in this episode oh god yes good point yes um so happy christmas i suppose or, or merry christmas depending on where you are in the world and and a happy and prosperous and um book selling 2019 how does yes. that work? Sound all right? Well, we need to save our happy new year to the next We episode. do. That's very true. Yes. But yes. This is happy Christmas. I don't know where you say happy and where you say merry. Where's that division? That I get confused. Yeah. Sometimes I've had readers say, do you say happy Christmas? When I, when I send out saying, saying happy Christmas. I don't know whether it's an American thing to say merry Christmas. Okay. My mum's well, calling again. There you go. She really wants to get hold of you. We, we better say goodbye then. And we will say <laughs> a very happy Christmas, stroke Merry Christmas to you. Thank you so much for being with us in 2018. It's going to be another exciting year for us in this fast developing, rapidly changing world of indie publishing. And we are in the right place, you and me. And uh, can't wait to, uh, to move on with that. So we'll speak to you from the Self Publishing Show next week. Bye bye. Bye bye. Get show notes, the podcast archive, and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com. Join our thriving Facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash Facebook. Support the show at patreon.com forward slash selfpublishingshow. And join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author. Publishing is changing. So get your words into the world and join the revolution with The Self-Publishing Show.